and welcome to My Security TV and our Tech and Sec Weekly. My name is Chris Coverage. I'm the executive editor with My Security Media. Today, we're joined again, uh, second time this year, by Emeritus Professor Hugh White from the Australian National University. This is on his latest uh, essay with the quarterly essay, Sleep, Walk to War, uh, Australia's Unthinking Alliance with America. Last time we were speaking about Taiwan, and Taiwan is definitely within this particular essay, but there's definitely a different angle uh, to this body of work that uh, Hugh has been writing. So without further ado, Hugh White, Emeritus Professor of Strategic Studies, School of International Political and Strategic Studies with the Australian National University. Hugh, great to have you back. Great to be with you, Chris. Thanks. And... Uh, I didn't realise the the extent of this particular essay until I started reading it and flicking through to work out, hang on, this is practically a book uh, yeah. <laughs> on it in its own right. Um, and there's a various ways that I, I wanted to start, kind of start. And one is your opening sentence where, you know, this is the most extraordinary and consequential events in the history of Australia's foreign policy in relation to uh, Australia's relationship with China and the sort of the, the way that that has turned bad. Uh, and also, I suppose the other key point that you make in your essay is the biggest, this is the biggest shift in our international environment since European settlement. So I suppose the first question is how controversial and how much did you really want to give weight to this particular essay? How critical did you see? You've written a couple of quarterly essays before. Did you, how much of an opportunity did you see about this particular body of work? Uh, and what was your kind of underlying point? Were you, were you trying to be controversial in this? Well, uh, Chris, a good question. I, I, I never try to be controversial in the sense that I never try to do more than just set out the arguments as I see them uh, to describe the situation we're in and what I think we ought to be doing about it. So I'd say it's the facts and the situation rather than me that's been controversial. But, but as those you know, references you made to the opening statements in the, in the essay suggest, uh, you can't help but be controversial when you are talking about something which yeah. is, I think, you know, genuinely seismic, genuinely tectonic. I mean, you know, the point I made in that first line is that I, I don't, I can't recall a time when our relationships with a country as important to us as China is today, economically, strategically, diplomatically, and so on, have been as bad as they are now. And I think that's something that we need to focus on. You know, that that. That we've allowed, or for one way or another, our relationship with China has gone down the tubes, and 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 then the second point you touched on is that I'm one of the key themes of the essay is that in order to understand what's gone wrong with our relationship with China, we have to recognise that it's not just some sort of bilateral, you know, diplomatic spat where people have been impolite to one another. It reflects a truly fundamental, truly technotic shift in Australia's international setting. Because for the first time since European settlement, since 1788, uh, we can no longer expect that Asia will continue to be dominated by what I somewhat shorthandedly call an Anglo-Saxon power. Because you know, if you think back to 1788, Britain was the dominant, was the globe, was the strongest economy in the world, yep. was the globally dominant maritime power, and was the primary strategic power in Asia. And then, of course, when Britain faded away and you know you can have a debate about when that exactly happened but let's take the fall of Singapore in February 1942 as the hinge point then America was there to pick up the ball and run with it and you know so Australians just think it's completely normal to have a, a great and powerful friend um, an English an English speaking global power there in Asia to make Asia safe for us and make it easy for us to make our way in Asia and so we take it for granted and the point I'm making in the essay and really central to my argument is that that's no longer true and that Australia's we therefore have to start rethinking our relationship with Asia and ask ourselves how do we make our way in an Asia which is no longer dominated and made safe for us by an Anglo-Saxon ally and of course right at the heart of that is an argument that um, that we cannot rely on the United States to defeat China's challenge and somehow reassert its primacy and take us back to the world we used to be in because John is just too strong these days. Do you think the world's gotten used to the hegemony approach of, of, the, of just having the US as a global power and just having one and we've forgotten human history? You do kind of write that, uh, you know, that hasn't always been the case and the future might well be shared. And yeah. do you think the world economically 
is able to actually do that? Well, that's a really that's a really interesting question. I mean, I think what happened was that with the end of the Cold War, with the collapse of that bipolar global order that was so characteristic of the Cold War decades, and the apparent emergence of America as this unipolar power, this hyperpower, as a Frenchman famously called it, the image of a world in which America would be unchallengeably predominant on every dimension of national power, biggest economy, deepest technology, strongest military, strongest political system, you name it, you know, ideologically dominant. And, you know, that was an image of the world, which for Australia and for a lot of countries in the West, Japan, NATO, of course, you know, this was very congenial. Well, it's still congenial. Yeah. You know, I mean, as, as you as you've indicated, I mean, my essay is all about saying this isn't going to last. But 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 that's that's to me is a great regret. You know, if if I had a vote on the issue, I would vote for continued U.S. primacy globally and in Asia forever because it really works well for us. Yeah. But my 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 point is that whilst we in the West fell in love with that, n not everybody did, and you know, Russia didn't buy that. And we can see the consequences of that in the Ukraine today. And China didn't buy it. Now, what China did very cleverly was in the famous slogan of uh, Deng Xiaoping, it, it bided its time and hid its power and didn't claim leadership until it was strong enough to challenge directly. Yep. But it, it, it seemed to me, and you know, I've, as you in, implied in your opening remarks, I've been writing about this stuff for a while now, <laughs> but it, it, seemed, it seemed to me that all along the Chinese were never sold on that model of global order. They always wanted to reassert their own role as a great power in their part of the world. And so exactly as your question uh, foreshadowed, you know, I, I think there are a lot of powerful states in the world of which China and Russia are two important ones who don't buy into the idea of a unipolar US led order, who do want to, who do want to see the reemergence of what's been much more, historically much more common, and that is a multipolar order where you have a series of great powers, each is dominant in its own region, and at the global level, they all kind of have to, you know, work together and get on somehow. And you know, in a way, that that was actually the vision of global order that was that was embedded in the United Nations in 1945 at the end of the Second World War. That's that's really what the P5 and the Security Council was trying to capture. It identified five global great powers um, and said, OK, these these are the guys at the top table. Uh, these are going to be dominant in their own regions or in their own empires, and they're going to have to work together to, to settle global issues. And I think in a sense what we're doing is we see China seeking to become the dominant power in East Asia and the Western Pacific, Russia seeking to become again the dominant power in East Asia. I think India is seeking to become the dominant power in South Asia and the Indian Ocean. America remaining the dominant power in the Western Hemisphere. I think we're returning to that kind of multipolar order. Now, the, the challenge for globally is to make a multipolar order like that work um, and stay peaceful. And the challenge for Australia, which is m much bigger, is to recognise that in that multipolar order, which we seem to be sliding towards, the uh, Australia is going to end up in an Asia which is no longer dominated by the Anglo-Saxons, no longer dominated by America. We're going to end up in an Asia in which I think most likely outcome will be dominated in a kind of competitive way by China and India. And China will be the dominant power in East Asia and the Western Pacific and India will be the dominant power in South Asia and the Indian Ocean and will sit on the boundary line between those two spheres of influence. Uh, Penny Wong was talking uh, in, I think it was Singapore yesterday, but yeah. um, and on Australia and ASEAN. Do you think um, Australia should sort of become part of ASEAN uh, or are we best out on our own and sort of leading with the Pacific? I suppose because you do point out in your last sort of chapter is sort of the six steps, steps out of this mess, as yeah. you call it. Um, but you know, there's a couple of ways I wasn't wanted to take it, but I suppose just on this point of, you know, the rise of Indonesia and, and where Indonesia is likely to be going as, a, as, a, as an economic power, is this a, a time that Australia should shift to ASEAN and really uh, sort of lock ourselves in with ASEAN? Well, look, really, really good question. Look, I think the first point to make is that 
what, I mean, I'll come back to the question as to what we should be doing, but I'll tell you first what we shouldn't be doing. Because I think what we shouldn't be doing is what we're doing now, which is yeah. trying to support the United States in preventing this transformation happening, trying to preserve the US-led order in Asia and yeah. globally. Um, and, you know, I can completely understand emotionally why we want to do that. Um, but I think it's doomed to failure. Uh, I don't think the United States is going to be strong enough to to resist China's bid to become the leading power in East Asia and the Western Pacific, or for that matter, strong enough to stop India becoming the, the, the leading power in its part of the world. And I think the attempt to do so, and in particular, the attempt to deter China from pursuing its challenge by, by way of military threats uh, is very dangerous. It's, it's going to be unsuccessful. And I think what's more it carries a significant risk, not a certainty, but a significant risk that that results in a war which the United States wouldn't win and which could easily become a nuclear war and catastrophic for everyone. So my first point is whatever else we do, we should stop, we should stop pretending to ourselves that military threats can preserve the old US led order in East Asia and keep everything the way it was. And as I say, much as I'd like it to remain the way it was, I just don't think yeah. that's going to work. So the, but the, the next question, of course, as you say, is, well, what do we do instead? Yeah. Now, I do think that a very important part of that is going to be building uh, much denser relations with our Southeast Asian neighbours because they are, in the end, in this with us, if you know what I mean. The thing about Southeast Asia, it's a peculiarity yeah. of our strategic geography, is that we're surrounded by these small and middle powers who are also, like us, kind of on the margin between an Indian and a Chinese sphere of influence. We're all going to want to do whatever we can to maintain good relations with those great powers, but also to, re to, re to retain the maximum independence and freedom of manoeuvre from each of them and between them. And I therefore think we have a lot in common and more in common than we've had in the past with the, with the Southeast Asians. And, and in particular, of course, and you were absolutely right to mention this with Indonesia, because Indonesia is not just another South, Southeast Asian country. It's, it's not, not even in some ways a middle power on grounds of raw economic weight. It's likely to be the fourth biggest economy in the world well yeah. before the middle of the century. Now, how or whether, and if so, how Indonesia translates that massive economic weight into national power and if it starts to behave itself as a great power in its own right, a third a third Asian great power making a triangle, whether that happens or not or whether Indonesia continues to be a kind of oversized middle power, I don't know. But either way, it's going to be incredibly important to us. Yep. So I do think refocusing our relations with, on Southeast Asia in a way that I don't think we've done for about the last 25 years um, is is really important. And I think that means we have to do a couple of things. One is that our diplomacy in Southeast Asia over the last 10 years or so especially has been, I think, pretty um, um, malconceived because what we've basically done to Southeast Asia is go to them and try and, so to speak, deliver Washington's talking points to them. We have said to them, look, we need America to remain the dominant power in East Asia. You should support America in pushing back against the Chinese. And the, and the fact is the countries of Southeast Asia just don't buy that. They understand that China is not going to be kept in a box that they're very worried about China, of course, but they are also very conscious that China is not a problem that could be wished away by by uh, appealing to US power. And they therefore uh, focus very much on how they learn to live with it. And I think we should be joining them in that conversation. Um, whether that actually means joining ASEAN or not, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not, I don't think, I think sometimes we focus too much on ASEAN as an institution and not enough as on the individual countries as individual countries. But so I'm not sure we shouldn't join ASEAN, but I think the really important thing is to focus on deep and in our case, much more um, uh, much more open minded conversations with our Southeast Asian neighbours about how they plan to handle the predicament we're all going to find ourselves in in the decades ahead and stop telling them that what they should do is to support our what I regard as entirely misconceived attempt to kind of put our finger in the dike and stop China's rise um, by uh, by appealing to American primacy. Do, do you think China's kind of blocked Australia into this approach, though, over time? Uh, one thing I wanted to kind of raise was the sort of the, um, the, the islands and the Sakaku Islands yeah. and the like, and the militarization uh, around those islands. And was that like a bit of a turning point uh, where that had America pushed back back then? 
well, well I think allow them to militarize and clearly uh, militarize these islands and not do anything was that kind of the start of the end I mean there must have been other trigger points but really you know when I read your essay and I got to that point yeah. I was like yeah well why would they just allow that to happen they're obviously stepping yeah. back or not yeah. stepping down yeah no look it's i think i think the, the 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 pattern of chinese assertiveness in the south china sea which i think you know the historians looking back on it will judge uh took a really sharp turn upwards in about march 2012 which was just a few months <laughs> after obama had come to canberra and announced the pivot and yeah. i think that that did really constitute the point at which China's challenge to American leadership in East Asia became overt. Now, I, th I think, you know, it's worth bearing in mind that ch the challenge came first. I mean, it's, you know, what drives China's challenge is a simple fact that as its power grew to approach Americas, it simply wanted to do, it has simply wanted to do what great powers always do. That is, they want to dominate, they want to dominate their surrounding areas. And just as America dominates the, 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 the Western Hemisphere has done since 1824, with the declaration of the Monroe Doctrine, China wants to do the same thing. And of course, in China's case, they tend to think it's going back to what they used to have before, uh, well, we Europeans got in there and screwed it up for them. So I think, you know, that, it, that, that, that motivation has very deep roots. But what happened in the South China Sea was, I think, a clear attempt by China to test US resolve to push back. And it seems to me that what was really important for the Chinese was not so much the bases themselves. I, I must say, looking at it from a military perspective, it seems to me those bases are pretty operationally useless in anything anything above a kind of mere police action, because they're you know very easy to uh, to neutralise. Um, you know, not a not a very big not a, a very tempting target if I can put it that way. But 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 strategically, they've been extremely valuable because what what they showed was that when China did things which America clearly didn't want them to do, the Americans were nonetheless not prepared to take steps required to stop yeah. them because the Americans didn't want to risk a war with China. And the contrast is, you know, if you think back, if the Chinese had tried doing what they did in Scarborough Shoals or Mischief Reef um, uh, in the 1990s, the, the Americans would have just sent in the Seventh Fleet and, and the Chinese would have backed off and that would have been the end of the story. It would have been a one-day wonder. And the fact they weren't prepared to do that in the years after 2012, I think was intended by the Chinese as a demonstration that China's power was rising and America's power was declining. And and that's that, if you like, is a classic example of how um, uh, the, 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 the shift in, in order, the, the, the decline of a, of, a, of a declining power, the rise of a rising power is symbolized and demonstrated and in a sense achieved by these tests of resolve and power. And, um, and I think, you know, from Australia's point of view, um, we've, we've perhaps made a mistake in aligning ourselves so closely with US policy on that. The trouble we had and the trouble America had was that, um, you know, once a year, uh, the, the US Secretary of Defense and our Defense Minister would turn up at the Shangri-La Dialogue in Singapore and deliver a speech that says to the Chinese, you guys mustn't do what you're doing in the South China Sea. <clears throat> and every year the Chinese kept on doing it. Yeah, and we went back the next year and said the same thing, and the Chinese kept on pouring cement, and and you know that that made us look weak, and it made America look weak. Well, it's in your chapter from denial to delusion. Do you think it we is. just got sold on the Chinese diplomat uh, diplomacy, which they said you know it's not nothing to be afraid of, and you know it's not military focused and the like, and we just were either in denial or deluded ourselves? Well, I think I think what happened was that. Um, that w w we in Australia simply could not believe that America would not at some point stand up to the Chinese. And, you know, it's easy to say, oh, we're going to stand up to them eventually, but not today. We'll do it tomorrow. We'll do it tomorrow. Yeah. We'll do it tomorrow. And so I think, um, you know, th th there was and there remains in Canberra to this very day, I think, a very deep faith that one way or the other, America is going to find a way to deter the Chinese, to push the Chinese back into their box, to make the Chinese go back to accepting American primacy as a foundation for the East Asian order, which is, you know, that's what the Chinese did in the decades after Nixon met Mao in Beijing in 1972. That's what made the decades since 1972 so peaceful and stable and harmonious in Asia and, and so good for Australia. Yep. Um, and that's why for, 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 for years, Australian political leaders could say, we don't have to choose between America and China. We didn't have to choose between them because they weren't strategic rivals because China accepted America as the dominant power. But after about 2010, 
when or maybe 2009 i mean the historians will have some fun trying to pin down the exact date but around about that time the chinese threw over they abandoned the 1972 undertaking started overtly to challenge uh, america and that challenge became more and more overt through the south china sea stuff as we've discussed but in, but in australia we kept on pretending to ourselves and i think as i say i think our governments on both sides of politics still do believe that one way or the other the americans are going to find a way to fix this and and when they failed to do so when they failed to stand up to china effectively in the south china sea we just took the view that well you know they decided that they were going to stand up to them later well the fact is that time's not on our side that china's power has continued to grow economically militarily and economic you know in terms of its trade relations and so um if there was a time to stand up to china and try and push it back into its box it was more than a decade ago Correct, um, and that's that's kind of my point. Is when they started doing that, that would have that was the last hurrah, really, because now you are talking about, and you do sort of play out the uh, real risk if we go to war that it's likely to be a nuclear uh, war, yeah. and it's bad for everybody. Um, I suppose you just mentioned the economic, diplomatic, and military challenges for America, and you asked, you know, what's what's at stake for America. I'm not too sure you covered the ideological yeah. uh, aspect, the difference between China and America and, and the West, uh, you know, and this is why the alignment of Russia and, and China together, the, the uh, ideology is different. And do you think that is sufficient to, uh, to, to go to war over on no, a, that basis alone? It's a really, it's a really important point. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll confess as I, re, you know, you sort of reread the essay after you put it out and you think, oh, I should have made more of that. Um, so look, one of the key, just going back a couple of steps, one of the key debates which we have sort of skipped over in the in the dialogue in Australia and for that matter in, in the United States and Europe is the question about what follows if the US-led order falls away. What we discussed a few minutes ago earlier in, in this conversation was that what would, be, what would replace the US-led unipolar order would be a multipolar order. But a lot of people, a lot of people in Australia, a lot of people in Europe and America think that what's going to replace the US-led unipolar order is a China and Russia-led unipolar order. And instead of, you know, the US-led unipolar order being based on the ideologies of, 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 you know, democratic politics and market economics that, you know, we share and value and, and espouse, we'd have an international order that was based on uh, autocracy and managed market economics of the strange kind that we see in China, which we would, of course, for reasons I think we'd all understand, find much less congenial. Now, um, uh, and, you know, Scott Morrison, for example, when he talked about the arc of autocracy, um, uh, uh, talked about this. And, of course, if that was true, if that is what, what emerges, then that would pose a direct ideological threat to Australia's political system to America's political system to the European Europe political system and that fear that concern is what we saw reflected for example in the language that came out of the NATO summit in Madrid last week where they yep. talked about China posing a challenge to the security uh, you know ideology values etc of, of of Europe as well as you know causing uh, challenges in Asia now it's a it's a really important question which one of those visions of the future alternative order is correct if we think we're heading for a multipolar order then it's not going to be as good as the unipolar us-led order but it's not going to be a disaster for us you know we've lived in multipolar orders before it just requires it's, it's harder work it's a bit more risky but it's not in short it's not something to fight a nuclear war to prevent but if you thought that we're likely to fall straight from a US-led unipolar order to a Chinese-led European order or a China and Russia-led European order, then that's, that is worrying. I mean, that would be very, uh, you know, cause a lot of anxiety because just as under the US-led unipolar order, we tended to assume that US values and political um, uh, ideologies or rather the values that we in the West share with America uh, would be spread around the world then it's natural to fear that if, if you had a, a international, unipolar international order in which China was the globally dominant power, it would spread its political system around the world. And that's something that we wouldn't want. However, I, I, th I think the fear that we will um, end up with a Chinese-led unipolar order is very overdrawn. 
I'm, I'm pretty bullish about China. I think China's going to be the strongest economy in the world. I think it's going to have very significant uh, uh, military capabilities, air and maritime capabilities. I think its nuclear capacity is going to grow. But I don't think it's going to be strong enough to dominate the world um, because there's just too many other centres of power out there. Yeah. Uh, it, there's going to be India. It won't even dominate Asia. It's going to, there's going to be America. I mean, America's not going to disappear and become, you know, become Portugal. It's, America's still going to be a hugely powerful um, uh, a country with a, with a very strong position in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, there's still going to be Russia. Now, some people think that you know the declaration of a of a you know no limits partnership between Beijing and Moscow mean that you know the Chinese and the Russians are locked together like this for all time. Well, that just defies strategic history. Um, uh, the, the 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 Russians and the Chinese today have a very clear alignment of interests because both of them are trying to challenge American primacy in their part of the world. They both want to establish uh, uh, their position as a great power in a multipolar order. And so the, the convergence of their objectives and interests at the moment is very strong. But once they've achieved that, I think they're, they're, they'll, they'll return to their more naturally competitive state. And in particular, I think you'll find the Russians are very, very determined to ensure that they don't fall themselves under China's shadow and become a subordinate middle power under a Chinese in a Chinese sphere of influence. Um, I had the I had the good fortune to spend a week or so in Moscow at the end of 2019, in which I talked about this issue very directly with a lot of uh, of uh, Russian um, figures, experts of various sorts. And and I must say there was the, the one message I came away from there was that was that they're very keen to cooperate with 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 Russia. To undermine U.S. what they see as U.S. hegemony over them, but they're absolutely determined to avoid Chinese hegemony, and so I think the the chance, the idea that China, with or without Russia, ends up as the globally dominant power, it's just not going to happen. Yeah, we are going to end up in a much more complex world than that. And the good news is that that means that that the future we face, if the U.S. led order deteriorates, or I would say when the US led order deteriorates, is not as bleak as Scott Morrison's arc of instability stuff would have you um, would have you believe. And that therefore, I think we that certainly that means that it's certainly not worth our while going to war fighting a, a war that I think we're very unlikely to win. And which, as you mentioned, is very likely to become a nuclear war. I don't think it's worth fighting World War Three. And it's effectively over Taiwan at the end of the day, and you've kind of sort of said, okay, basically allow China to, um, uh, however we want to word uh, what they would do to Taiwan, but basically unify Taiwan yeah. to China in terms of their language. Um, yeah. But again, you do admit that that's not a good thing for Taiwan. That's, yeah. you know, if you're a Taiwanese... Okay. Uh, and you see America pull out or basically everyone's hands up and says, OK, uh, whatever happens, happens. Um, you do admit that that's not pleasant yeah. uh, for Taiwan and what we've already seen that in Hong Kong. Is that just the nat natural order of things now and, and Australia just backs down? And I suppose any comments on that? But the, the change, the, the um, had Morrison's government sort of continued on, I'd imagine the rhetoric would have either raised or, or ongoing. But now with a Labor government, the tension seems to have been off a little bit um, and their engagement internationally and in the Pacific and with ASEAN, I mentioned Penny Wong yesterday, seems a bit more less uh, bullish, as you say, as well. So is it a good thing that the Labor government's got in just to change that the and, and sort of bring down the tension a little bit? Uh, and then also your thoughts on Taiwan. Is that just a, a, yeah. something we need to just back off? Yeah, well, let, let's 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 t talk about the Taiwan issue because it's 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 very it's very important and it's and it's very tough. I mean, I've said that you know the good news about a multi moving to a multipolar order is that it's not as scary and horrendous as the idea of of a Chinese led unipolar order globally. Um, but that doesn't mean it's a bowl of cherries. Um, yeah, it's it's not. What it means is that to 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 accept a unipol a, a global multipolar order, and 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 to accept as part of that 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 a number of great powers around the world are going to establish their own spheres of influence in their own regions, means that some pretty bad things are going to happen mm. in in some of those spheres of influence. Um, uh, and the question that we face, and it really is a question we face. It's not a question we can duck 
is whether those bad things that would happen are worse than what would be required to stop it happening. And uh, I mean, I draw a historical analogy, which is, which is not a reassuring one in some ways. And that is that at the end of the Second World War, uh, in uh, January 1945, uh, Roosevelt and Churchill and Stalin got together at Yalta to work out, essentially, to design a multipolar post-war order. That, as we said earlier in the conversation, yeah, that's, in that's what was embedded in the United Nations. And the deal they did in, in January 1945 was underpin the, the arrangements for the UN that were agreed in San Francisco a few months later in April 1945. But, but in the process of that deal they did at Yalta, they agreed that the Soviet Union would continue to dominate Eastern Europe. And in particular, they agreed, so to speak, to give Poland away. Now, you know, if you're Polish, and I, you know, I've talked about this to Polish friends, it's pretty emotive stuff. I mean, you know, you could say it condemned Poland and the rest of Eastern Europe to, um, you know, 40 years under the Soviet yoke, which was pretty tough, very tough. Um, but the alternative, as Roosevelt understood, was to follow the defeat of the Nazi regime with a war between the West and the Red Army, a war they wouldn't have won. Mm. And so, you know, it was a very tough choice, but it's, you know, we, we don't, we don't do, we don't fulfill our responsibilities to make a morally um, coherent judgment if we only look at the evil on one side of the spec on one side of the, of the scales. And so whilst I'm very sympathetic to people who think that abandoning Taiwan will be a terrible thing to do, I, I don't have much time for people who argue, who, who aren't there, therefore prepared to argue on the other side that it's worth our while fighting a war that we wouldn't win and that would be very likely to go nuclear. Yeah. Uh, in, instead, we don't actually do the, 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 uh, the Taiwanese any favours um, by fighting a war over them that we're not going to win. And so I, I think and you know, it's got to be brutally frank about this. I don't think we have a way of preventing China um, doing essentially what it wants with Taiwan. And um, because the Taiwan, because the Chinese are very, very resolved to do something about it. And uh, in the end, they care about it more than we do. And that's a very tough conclusion to reach. Um, but and I don't think we should shy away from it. Um, and you know, the same is going to be true in Eastern Europe. Um, I use the phrase in the essay, a new Yalta. We are, I mean, not we, Australia, um, but the Europeans are going to have to find a new way to live with Russia. It's not going away. And I can't conceive of a stable relationship between Russia and the West of, and the rest of Europe, which doesn't concede some kind of sphere of influence to Moscow in what the Russians call their near abroad. Now, what extent it should have is a different question. And and, and I, well, when I say that, I don't say that that, that for a moment justifies either Russia's invasion of the Ukraine or the particularly brutal way in which that invasion has been undertaken. I think they're, they're both entirely reprehensible and, and, and proper to oppose. But that's, it's different sa saying that from saying that, 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 the, that Russia should not, in the long run, be accorded some kind of sphere of influence over its near abroad. Um, because it's worth bearing in mind. I mean, talking about spheres of influence always sounds a bit creepy, but actually, that's what we claim in the South Pacific. Yeah, when we I say think you've made a good point. You know, yeah, when we say this, that. you know, when we say the Solomon Islands, they're not allowed to have a, they're not allowed to have a Chinese base. We're yeah. saying, we're saying exactly, we're making exactly the same claim. We're implementing it differently, but we're making exactly the same claim as the Russians say when they as when they say to the Ukrainians, "You mustn't join NATO." So, um, you know, it's you know, you, you, it's, it's a very important point to to raise because we do have to confront very frankly and directly the moral questions, um, dilemmas that the move to a multipolar global order uh, entails. But you can't look at, at 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 those things. You know, the fate of Ukraine, the fate of Taiwan, and so on. On the one hand without recognising on the other, the enormous moral imperative to, in, to avoid catastrophic wars. And, um, and uh, that is the choice we face. And we yeah. might not like that, but I'd, uh, you know, if, if there's a third way, I'd, I'd like someone to drop me an email and tell me what it is. Now, well, the, the, my, my only other thought there is we always seem to be at war. There's always a war going on somewhere. And uh, if anything, it's probably a good thing that the US is fit, almost fatigued uh, with war with 20 years in Afghanistan and coming out and now we've got yeah. a, a new war in Europe yeah uh, so I think you know war is a machine and a uh, an economy on its own so I think 
you know, I don't have too much faith that uh, we're ever going to not have a war. It's a matter oh. of what we are fighting over no, that, that, uh, that's, and where. <laughs> that, that's true, but it's also a question of scale. I mean, we're, we're very yeah. used to wars, as, as you say, but we haven't seen a war between great powers, one great power against another since 1945. And we haven't seen wars between nuclear armed states ever. Well, except the border border clashes between China and and the Soviet Union in the late yeah. 60s, border clashes between India and Pakistan in the early 2000s. But both of them were just little border clashes. But a, yeah. a war over Taiwan wouldn't be a border clash. And so this this one of the one of the problems I think is that when you know people like Peter Dutton talk about oh we might have to go to war, their their vision is oh it'd be you know it'd be a big day in the office like invading Iraq or you know worrying about uh, about Ukraine. No, no, this is incomparably bigger. I mean, this you know to use the phrase that uh, Joe Biden has used, this really would be World War Three. Yeah, and 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 I think you know we in a sense we've you know the point you make is a very important one because we've kind of particularly since about nineteen ninety. You know, from from the end of the Vietnam War through to about 1990, my whole adult like, life. <laughs> well, exactly, but but for yeah. a while, you know, when when I first got into this business in 1980, and between uh, and between 1980 and 1990, we just didn't go to war. And 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 what's more, people found it really hard to imagine that we might conceivably go to war. I mean, yeah. the, the first coup happened in Fiji in 1986, uh, and the government I was then working as a staffer for uh, Kim Beasley, who was defence minister at the time. And the, and, and the government uh, sent us, you know, very small force to do, to, to, be, to be available to do an evacuation of Australian citizens. And all hell broke loose because people thought this was some sort of huge military commitment. And, um, and you know, what it struck me at the time, just how unused we'd become to using armed forces as an instrument of policy. But since about 1990, um, we've become very used to it. And I think one of the problems is that we've forgotten that there's such a big difference between you know, something like Operation Desert Storm or the peacekeeping operations we did in Rwanda and Cambodia or so on, or, or the invasion of Iraq or the mission in Afghanistan, they're all, you know, this big. A war between China, with China over Taiwan would be that big. Yeah, um, right. And, you know, there's, there's, there's no analogy. And I, I think you do create the, a, a fair argument for, the, for America and, to, and particularly in, in where they are domestically whether they want another war uh, in the Pacific. Um, I suppose to finish off, you've got the six steps there on courage and imagination and, and on your closing. Um, your, your key takeaway on the discussions of the Australian current Australian government, the new Australian yeah. government, and, and as you were writing this, the election was on as well. So I take it as probably a good thing that the Morrison government didn't get re-elected. How confident are you? Because you make the point that the Labor government has uh, a reasonable history uh, in, on its engagement with China, and it was a, an election issue uh, in particular. Yeah, just your outlook for the Labor government and your initial observations of them as well. Uh, the Prime Minister Albanese is even under some criticism that he's on the floods because he's in the Ukraine. And it's like, okay, well, the guy can't win. But yeah. you know, what's your initial observations and outlook for the new Australian government and the way that they've uh, started their, their their term? Well, look, I, I think I think the good news is that um, the Albanese government so far is not following the example of its predecessor by deliberately using the tensions with China as a domestic political um, yeah. uh, football. And, you know, I think the historians will judge that Peter Dutton in particular and Scott Morrison, to some extent, was was quite content to talk up the confrontation with China in order to score points of, against Labor. And I think that will be judged by history correctly to be a shockingly irresponsible thing to do. Moreover, I do think that Dutton himself really convinced himself that going to war with China over Taiwan, which really means going to war with China in order to preserve the unipolar US-led order, yep. was a good idea. Um, and he certainly, in the way he, he articulated that idea, encouraged the United States to believe that Australia would support the United States if it decided to go to war. And I think that was a very dangerous thing to do because um, I, for the arguments I, I set out in the essay, as you mentioned, I actually don't think the United States will, but there will be people in Washington who are arguing that it should 
and the, the, the position of people like Dutton strengthens their argument and makes that kind of war more likely, which I think would be uh, a big mistake. And so the good news is that so far, uh, Labor is showing itself to be um, more, more responsible than that. On the other hand, the bad news is that I don't think Labor has come to office with any clear ideas of its own as to how to manage this issue forward. And in particular, I don't think they have any clear vision of an alternative future for Australia and Asia, which doesn't presuppose that US primacy is sustained. Um, and, and so even though they don't talk up the idea of going to war so much, they still do have that same underlying objective as their predecessors. That is that we do whatever it takes to make sure that America remains the dominant power in East Asia. And because I don't think that, as I've said several times now, I think that's desirable. I just don't think it's possible. Yeah. And policy is all about the art of the possible. So what they need to do is to focus on moving past that and developing a vision as to how Australia can flourish in an East Asia, which is no longer dominated by the United States. And I think that's, um, uh, that's a challenge which still lies ahead of them. And I'm not yet convinced that they're going to meet it. In terms of uh, the support that you've had for this essay, or the, the sort of yeah. the feedback, and ignoring yeah. the Twitter sphere, because I was going to also ask um, the any any word from the US, say, or France, or the UK on where Australia could be on our other allies on this kind of essay. How much feedback yeah. have you had? And yeah, yeah, and maybe positive first, and any potential ne negative as well. <laughs> you do have a you do. Uh, claim systematic failure of the intelligence, defence and foreign affairs establishments. And uh, you mentioned think tanks too, so uh, quite general. Yeah, just what's yeah. been the general feedback? Well, well, of course, it's early days yet because I think it's only been out for a week. Um, <laughs> okay. uh, uh, I have, um, you know, I have had some interest from what you might call the official family. Um, and uh, and I'll be having some discussions with them about, about the essay. Um, I, I, I wouldn't want to imagine, though, for a moment that there are people up in Parliament House, um, uh, you know, uh, turning a dog ear down on every page and uh, and and going through it with a highlighter, um, because it is it's it's pretty strong medicine because these are very difficult issues, as we said right at the beginning of this conversation. This is the biggest transformation in Australia's strategic circumstances in in 230 plus years of history and uh, we shouldn't underestimate just how hard it's going to be to get it right um and and so i'm i'm not surprised or for that matter disheartened by the fact that i haven't instantly had a call from the prime minister's office uh, uh, de demanding that i come over there and rewrite their speeches for them um <laughs> but i but i do think um that uh, that that there is uh the beginnings of an understanding that uh our policy of relying on America is is, is, is not going to work. And although um, uh, although I don't put as much emphasis on this as some other people do, I do think um, that the experience of Donald Trump as president has influenced people's thinking about that. I think that I, 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 my argument, I think, make the point in the essay that under any US president, the question would arise whether the costs and risks of preserving its primacy in East Asia are worth, uh, to, what, 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 worth to, to America. Um, uh, in terms of the imperatives of America to do so. And so I think it's not just a Donald Trump problem, but there's no doubt that Trump has dramatised and and yeah. made more vivid and immediate the, the doubts about where America is going to be 10 or 20 years from now. And so I think there is the, the beginnings of a, of a conversation um, amongst um, some people in and around government as to whether or not the course they're pursuing is the right one. Um, but I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't for a moment want to foreshadow that they're all going to become um, uh, avid fans of my argument and go around waving my quarterly essay like their little red book. I think we're a long way from that. Well, look, and it's not your first quarterly essay. Interestingly, you finished the essay uh, in the very same tone that you finished yeah. your previous essay yeah. uh, as well, which uh, is, is, was nice to read, but then also it's like, okay, have we moved at all uh, because it's not something, this is not necessarily new thinking from you yeah. either. Uh, yeah. Your analysis has kind of been quite consistent over time. Um, and look, I'm conscious of time. We haven't been able to solve uh, this tectonic problem uh, within the 45 minutes, but uh, I don't think anyone can read this essay without dog-earing it and highlighting <laughs> it. And, you know, I didn't even know where to start. But And we haven't touched on the quad 
or AUKUS. Uh, we haven't even looked at China's uh, sort of domestic yeah. situation yeah. in contrast to Amer yeah. America's yeah. domestic yeah. situation because yeah. there's a lot there. That, you know, it's a very messy pot, um, but you do do a, a, a fantastic job of sort of bringing it together and creating a uh, – get people's thinking and debating uh, this issue for Australia's future, and I think it's really – yeah, really important, and I, I take these um, these sessions with you and the, the sort of the back to back uh, on the Taiwan SA uh, quite nicely, given the timing. We really are watching history in the making, are we not? Oh, oh yes, absolutely. It's a bit, you know, history is not just something that happens to our grandparents. You know, it's happening to us right now, and we might have more of it than we want before we finish. Right. Well, look, uh, that's Sleepwalk to War: Australia's Unthinking Alliance with America. The latest quarterly essay from Emeritus Professor uh, Hugh White there uh, with the Australian National University. Hugh, a pleasure. Thank you very much for joining us on My Security TV. Thanks, Chris. Really appreciate the opportunity. Good man. Thank you.